Thank you, Professor Yeo. Uh, I'm very much honored to be here as a speaker. And I'm uh, so grateful to the organizers of the forum and also to uh, all the staff members, including the uh, interpreters. Well, as Professor Yeo said, I'm going to uh, uh, make my presentation and read my paper in English, although uh, my English is much worse than my Chinese. Well, simply because the Chinese version of this paper has been published already. It's not new here in China. Uh, on November uh, 26, 1941, the authorities of British Burma censored an airmail letter written in English from a woman in Kunming, Yunnan, to her friend in Singapore. It reads as follows. I am a typist now in the Fifth Route Air Force. Sometime, if foreigners came, they asked me to be translator. But I am so sorry for my English. I just do my best. I think these foreigners will excuse me when I got some mistakes. Last month, four English pilots came here uh, from Rangoon. Our commandant gave a feast for them in Guangxingyuan. I was a translator that night. One of them is young and charming. I talked with him very much. I like him more than Fred. The American volunteer groups will soon come here. They can have many chance, chances to uh, make acquaintances with them. I learn dancing. I'll make myself not like a girl came from a small island. Ha <laughs> ha, what a crazy. <laughs> well, regarded as a, uh, quote, disclosure of movements of British and American airmen, unquote, the British authorities condemn this letter. However, this letter rouses interest for reasons other than just military secrecy. Apart from its military achievement of defending China from Japan's invasion, this letter reminds us of another aspect of US military support for China during the resistance war, a fact that has often been forgotten. For a considerable length of time, many Americans led their daily lives in China. And who was Fred, anyway? Well, the US military support for China began in 1941. As the American Volunteer Group, or AVG, uh, an aerial unit of only 200 odd members, commonly known as the Flying Tigers, commanded by Claire Lee Chenault under the direction of Chiang Kai-shek and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The US government decided that uh, the Lend-Lease Act applied to uh, China and loaned them funds to purchase airplanes. Chenault, a retired US Army colonel, had been working as an advisor to the Chinese Air Force since 1937 to resist the Japanese invasion. This made him China's reliable bodyguard. In 1942, the AVG was inducted into the US regular troops of the China Burma India Theater, commanded by Joseph Warren Stilwell, uh, who later was succeeded by Albert Cody Wedemeyer in 1944. By the time the war ended, the number of American military, military personnel stationed in China totaled 48,000. Most of those military personnel were ordinary American citizens who had no earlier contact with China and who were mostly ignorant of China's language, society, culture, and history. When they suddenly had to live in a country on the other side of the globe, where the style and standard of living were totally different from those in the United States, how did the Americans lead their daily lives? How did the Chinese authorities and people respond to their presence? In short, how did everyone involved perceive and cope with the drastic differences. For the United States and China to fight the war conjointly, these must have been questions of vital importance. So now let's uh, take a look at the situation of accommodation. Uh, to serve the foreign military personnel working with the Chinese Air Force, the National Military Council of the Chinese National Government set up the War Area Service Corps, or, or WASC, W-A-S-C, uh, on August 8, 1937 right after the uh, Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, and named J.L. Huang, Huang Renlin, uh, its director. Huang had studied at Vanderbilt and Columbia, received training in social service at the YMCA in Cleveland, and worked as a secretary of the Shanghai YMCA. After joining the nationalist government in 1928, uh, Huang was in charge of serving many foreign guests, and General George Catlett Marshall, US Chief of Staff, uh, later bestowed upon him the title. China's number one meter and greeter. This, uh, directed by Chiang Kai-shek to serve the AVG, the WASC moved its headquarters from Chongqing to Kunming in order to welcome the uh, American pilots and uh, ground crew to the Spring City in southwest China, worrying that, quote, 
the West had no experience with the personal habits of Occidentals, unquote. However, Chen Ault never left the task entirely to Huang. Chen Ault submitted the following list of requirements concerning the hostel's facilities, which tells us uh, what, the, what he considered vital for his group's daily life. One, each pilot should be provided with a separate room. Two, technical and clerical personnel should be provided with rooms in the ratio of two men to one room. Three, separate detached bathrooms and toilets may be provided for all personnel. Four, uh, a mess should be established uh, for each unit. Five, mess and kitchen furnishings uh, should provide ample equipment. Six, all mess halls and kitchens should be uh, screened and proper provisions made for maintaining the highest sanitary condition. Seven, wherever possible, game and recreation rooms should be uh, provided in the ratio of one room to 50 men. With the slogan, a home away from home, the WASC hostels at first satisfied the, satisfy the uh, AVG requirements. Charles R. Bond Jr., an AVG pilot, uh, described the Kunmin number two hostel as follows. Immaculate rooms for each pilot with a comfortable bunk, chair, table, chest of drawers, and small desk. In the middle of the room is a small charcoal heater. It is cold here. The service is good. The food is American. Not a thing. Hot water. You wee. I thought I would never get out of the wall. shower. Despite all such careful preparation, these excellent conditions did not last long. Upon his induction into the U.S. regular army on July, 9, uh, July 4, 1942, uh, the AVG was reorganized into the China Air Task Force, CATF, and then into the 14th Air Force on March 11, 1943, with the uh, increasing number of American troops stationed in China and the expansion of its field of activity. The WASC established and man managed more and more hostels all over China. They finally, uh, these finally totaled 194, housing 88,853 uh, military personnel. Because most hostels were located in relatively poor remote provinces, deterioration of service inevitably accompanied the numerical growth, making it increasingly difficult for the WASC to uh, satisfy American requirements. The United States military authorities reported the Chinese conception of sanitary protection leaves much to be desired, with the result that there have been many cases of diarrhea and dysentery among the uh, Americans quartered and fed in the West hostels, and warned that, quote, constant vigilance of commanding officers and medical personnel in the various U U.S. Army units in China was necessary to keep in check the incidence of disease traceable to lack of proper sanitary precautions in the WASC installations, unquote. That's uh, let's go on to the next part about food. Americans were uh, greatly concerned about whether they could maintain their uh, usual dietary habits. At, le uh, at least during the uh, AVG days, however, uh, this was an unnecessary fear, uh, for the food served at the WASC hostels was more than satisfactory to the Americans. The hostel at Zhang Yi had a full staff of servants, a good stock of wines, excellent food, and a nice mess hall. The cook who had previously worked for Westerners was praised as one of the best in China. Uh, he served ham, eggs, toast, hotcakes, and coffee for breakfast. Dinner consisted of a thick vegetable soup, a meat loaf containing chicken, local green peas that looked like lima beans, uh, creamed celery, chipped potatoes, an excellent hot custard with real maple syrup. To top that off, uh, he also served a banana and coffee. In supplying mess service to the Americans, uh, American military personnel, the WASC followed the ration chart provided by the U.S. Surgeon General's office. The rations per man per day consisted of the following. 18 ounces of meat, four eggs, 20 ounces of vegetables, 10 ounces of potatoes, two ounces of dry vegetables, 12 ounces of flour, two ounces of lard, five ounces of sugar, half an ounce of salt, 11 ounces of fruit, an ounce of peanuts, 0 0.4 ounces of tea. And some flavoring also. 
Thus, the West seemed to have done its best to ensure that the Americans could enjoy home cooking in a country halfway around the world. Nevertheless, the Flying Tiger's response to the West food was not always favorable. The US military authorities complained while far superior to the meager food ration furnished by the Chinese army to its soldiers, food provided in the West masses has often uh, fallen below the standard maintained in the uh, average American army mess. Similar to problems with the accommodations, the food's unpopularity most probably was a consequence of the uh, increasing number of American military personnel stationed in China. The expansion of the American field of activity must have inevitably uh, caused deterioration of the WASC's uh, mass services. Whether aware of the WASC's hardship or not, Chenault said, feeding the Americans was a tremendous job for the Chinese. The average Chinese lives mainly on rice in the South and noodles in the North. These staples are flavored by a few greens and on festive occasions by small amounts of meat. Americans ate more meat in a single meal than most Chinese families eat in a year. Eventually, the drain on livestock slaughtered to feed the 14th Air Force became serious. Eggs were the great staple, although even Chinese chickens could not keep up with the Americans, who polished off two or three eggs every morning. In the Kuming area alone, approximately 20,000 American military, military personnel daily ate 80,000 eggs and nearly 100 cattle. When cattle in the area became depleted, buffalo meat was substituted. But when even buffalo became scarce, the US military personnel were forced to dine on yak meat. However, after being properly grazed and fed, the yak meat was so good that the Americans could not tell the difference, according to J.L. Huan. Now let's talk about entertainment. Uh, various opportunities and facilities for entertainment had been prepared for the AVG members before their arrival in China. Materials were uh, gathered to organize softball teams, tennis teams, and volleyball teams. Movie projectors were ready, although films needed to be uh, supplied by air. The movies shown at the hostels were such relatively uh, new pictures as The Life of Emile Zola, Gone with the Wind, Rebecca, Waterloo Bridge, Casablanca, Watch on the Rhine, uh, This Land is Mine, Madame Curie, and Bathing Beauty. In remote towns, however, the Americans were not always provided with enough entertainment. Robert Smith, uh, stationed in Zhang Yi, asked a Chinese person in the neighborhood to lend him books and magazines. Smith read everything written in English, slowly and deliberately. To him, a magazine printed in 1935 was just as welcome as the latest, only three or four months old. Smith did not mind reading a serialized story, starting in the, mi in, starting in the middle although uh, he was disgusted when a story suddenly ended with to be continued in the next issue, because it would never come up. Under such circumstances, the Americans did not always stay obediently at the hostels. As early as November 1941, some AVG members in Kuming caused trouble. A Chinese report reads, uh, for the past few weeks, I have found that some of the personnel in the American volunteer group are always drunk in the hostel. And this is not the worst. On several occasions, they were badly drunk in the city, so much so that one of them lost his head completely and caught hold of a cook's chopper, intending to kill a woman with it. But fortunately, another person prevented him from doing any injury. To the Americans, the most serious problem was, quote, lack of companionship with the opposite sex, unquote. Indeed, uh, there seemed to have been some threads uh, attempting to take home Chinese women with whom they had fallen in love. In response to uh, oral inquiries from some AVG members regarding U.S. nationality laws, Troy L. Perkins, the United States Consul at Kuoming, uh, sent the following message to Chenault. According to our nationality laws, marriage of an alien to an American citizen does not confer American citizenship on the alien. A person in, in order to be eligible to citizenship must have a preponderance of either white or African blood or both. The naturalization of Chinese is specifically prohibited by statute. And frequently, some American personnel visited the red light districts in Kuoming and Kuiting. This often resulted in their inability to assume duty owing to uh, 
venereal infections. To solve this problem, Chenault sent his medical crew to India, where 12 Indian prostitutes were examined, medically cleared, and recruited to serve the CATF in China. In addition, a Chenault officer was sent to Guilin to select 13 prostitutes, fly them back to Kunming, and open a warehouse for the CATF members. Chenault said, the boys have got to get it, and they might as well get it clean as get it dirty. Enraged at this enterprise, Stilwell radioed his men in India, saying, no women to China, and ordered a thorough investigation, although this warehouse seems to have survived until the last stage of the war. The last part of my paper. Well, basically, uh, the Chinese were willing to bear the expenses of American troops stationed in China. At Chenault's insistence, uh, it was agreed that AVG members would pay a nominal fee of one US dollar a day for room, board, laundry, and other services, uh, while the Chinese government would fund the rest. After the AVG's induction into the US regular army on July 4, 1942, uh, the price became 85 new Chinese dollars. However, on December 1st, uh, Jiang Kai-shek ordered that all American military personnel be granted board and lodging free at all the West hostels. However, the Chinese attitude embarrassed the Americans. US military authorities predicted that in the final settlement of Lend-Lease after the war, the Chinese government would present a bill for these services. Because of the chaotic state of inflation, they also uh, feared that such a bill might exceed the amount advanced to China through Lend-Lease. In spite of the Chinese repeated assertion that the Americans were their guests, they did not clarify whether the Americans were paying guests as in a hotel or non-paying guests as in the home of one's host. The total expenses uh, for op operating hostels for four years from the AVG's induction into the US regular army to the, de to the departure of American military personnel uh, from China amounted to uh, 33 billion, 803 million, 425 thousand, 76, 8.34 new Chinese dollars. This figure roughly uh, equaled 1 billion, 733 million, 195 thousand US dollars. On the basis of the official rate of exchange at this time, 20 new Chinese dollars to 1 US dollar. Although the Americans were quite skeptical of the Chinese figures, speculating that there was considerable exaggeration, they were unable to determine the figure's accuracy since the WASC books uh, were not subject to examination without Chiang Kai-shek's personal approval. Because the Americans were considered as guests, they could not insist too strongly on making such an examination. In reply to a Roosevelt message on January 1, 1944, stating his desire that the United States bear the entire cost of maintaining its troops in China, uh, Chiang Kai-shek proposed that the United States loan China one billion US dollars to meet uh, part of its budget deficit in the year following the war and to allow some reverse lend lease on the US Army's expenses. And this seemed to have been Chiang Kai-shek's real motive. In other words, the Americans suspected that the Chinese were trying to write off the lend lease loan by exaggerating expenses for housing and feeding US troops stationed in China. Whether this suspicion was right or wrong, the Americans were aware of another aspect of China's uh, repeated refusal to accept the US payments, because apparently uh, the Chinese wished to continue to supply uh, service for its publicity value. The Americans might well allow them this asset and avoid arousing ill feeling by acting as if they were the WASC's employer or boss. In short, the Americans there, thereby needed to give face to the Chinese. The Chinese often emphasize the Sino-American alliance's equality, frequently using the phrase, fighting shoulder to shoulder. On November 13, 1942, the WASC decided that its relationship with the US Air Force should be neither supercilious nor obsequious. After all, they wanted not only military support, but also a spiritual respect or face as the host nation. And le now let's go on to my conclusion. Chenault described the living conditions of the Chinese soldiers commanded by his close friend Xue Yue as follows. Soldiers were mostly of farm boys, barefooted and clad in cotton quilting during winter and flimsy cheesecloth in the summer. They lived on rice and occasional greens and were badly undernourished. 
making them easy prey to malaria, jaundice, scurvy, dysentery, and cholera. There were no medical facilities with the armies. Most of the seriously wounded died from lack of treatment. Their combat losses were enormous. Disease took an even heavier toll. Human losses could be replaced more easily than equipment. When compared to the Chinese troops, the Americans, the American military personnel stationed in China were undoubtedly an extravagant bodyguard. Nevertheless, this situation was not merely a reflection of economic disparity between the two nations. An American report attributed the Chinese soldiers' inability to combat disease to their insufficient, poorly balanced diet. The Americans regarded this as the Chinese army's greatest weakness. The Chinese uh, did not improve conditions in spite of numerous American recommendations. The Americans, at, la at last, concluded that it was impossible to correct the Chinese evaluation of human life or the centuries-old notion that getting another man was more economical than saving uh, one who was sick or wounded. As Albert Wedemeyer lamented, no one in China had ever heard that an army marches on its stomach, and in most instances, soldiers who were wounded were left on the battlefields to rot and die. In contrast, the US Army paid constant attention to the body of its soldiers, looking out for their hygiene, nutrition, and morale. But this value derived not only from respect for each individual's human rights, but also from the aim to maximize the troops' fighting strength by maintaining their personal's, personnel's health. For this purpose, even their personal pastimes were to be kept under surveillance so that military discipline could be maintained. In addition to uh, exposing the Chinese to their lifestyle, the Americans tried to convince the Chinese of the values of hygiene, nutrition, and respect for individual human life. Having an extremely uh, abundant manpower, however, the Chinese were reluctant to accept this modern concept of valuing each individual for the sake of the nation, tending to regard the American military personnel, personnel mainly as an extravagant bodyguard. Uh, the Chinese were instead devoted to saving face, that is, playing the generous host who offered the guests the most courteous treatment, even in the most difficult situations. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much.